بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وجعلنا للمتقين إماما My brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It is a pleasure for me to be here and to be able to share some wonderful benefits from our religion and to pass on to you what I have from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger and I hope that tonight will be a very beneficial one for you so I welcome here to this wonderful congregation which inshallah will be full of prosperity and mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I ask Him subhanahu to make it a generous knowledge for us and a benefit in my presentation this evening, as Abu Hamza just introduced, and I thought that he was going to go through the whole lecture himself, it is about fasting from one's desires. I will attempt, inshallah, to explain the main purpose of why we fast. Why do we fast? Why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded this on us and not made it a sunnah? Why do we have to fast the whole month and abstain from the most basic needs? Why? I will enumerate, inshallah, some of the many benefits that we receive out of fasting. And I hope that, inshallah, you'll be able to walk away with something that you can think about and feel during Ramadan while you are fasting. And you can appreciate it. And I will, inshallah, try to demonstrate the link between desires and fasting from food and drink and intercourse and I'll emphasize insha'Allah on the real meaning of psalm of fasting in Islam my dear brothers and sisters in Islam it is a wonderful thing that we have in our religion that one of the five pillars is that we forsake we give up our eating and our drinking and our intercourse for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa whom Allah has chosen and this ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam needs to always be conscious and aware of Allah's presence you see when you watch someone who doesn't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they dress in a manner where they're not very aware about what the reactions of people will be towards the way they're wearing. Especially amongst our sisters, for example. Some of you here who are now wearing hijab, if you didn't wear it before, you probably used to wear you know, something else other than hijab. Probably, if you recall yourself, and you can share this with your sisters, you didn't realize you weren't aware really that without the hijab what kind of an effect it has on the male who looks at you what it makes you appear as and when you wear the hijab probably after a long time if you take it off you'll feel so conscious and aware you feel as though you are naked and for us wearing clothes if you are always used to wearing a shirt for example you take off that shirt in public you become immediately conscious and aware you feel as though you are naked it's because you have controlled yourself you have tamed yourself you have brought yourself to a level of awareness a human awareness consciousness and a Muslim has to always be conscious and tame themselves this way. Why am I mentioning this? Well, because this is what fasting is all about. To bring us to the level of consciousness and awareness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا 
قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها The nafs, this self of ours, myself, my soul and my body makes the self. Allah says, and the self, and the way Allah fashioned it and engineered it and made it. He gave this nafs, this self, the ability or the urge to do evil, and He gave it the ability or the urge to do good. Whosoever obeys, sorry, whosoever controls their nafs and their desire and their urges and their egos and their whims has lifted and elevated the value of their body and their soul higher and has become successful. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا And whoever obeys the whims and the egos and the desires then they have degraded themselves. So the nafs needs to be controlled, brothers and sisters. We have whims and desires of all sorts. And I said this in Sydney, that if you were to leave a human being for a few weeks, probably maybe a couple of months, without food, they will become cannibals. They'll eat the flesh of dead human beings. You yourself, don't be surprised, if you were left without food for a month, you will probably become a cannibal. I'm telling you this now. A human being can become the evilest of evil. And a human be- being can become higher than the angels themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ We have generously honored the son of Adam. But he did not say that about the angels. He made the angels prostrate to Adam alayhi salam. Prostrate to, uh, to Adam, to our father? The angels prostrate and put their heads down in humiliation to our father. As an honor and respect to the human being. You can become better than the angels. And you can become worse than Iblis himself. How? Well, if you obey your ego and whims. And let them go without any boundaries. They can become worse than the animals. Without a purpose. Without a means. Without any control, you will kill, you will murder, you will lose your patience towards anything. You'll become spoiled, you'll have pride, you become the most evilest and wicked person on earth. And this is why we hear about people who murder, those people who molest children, those people who cut up babies and, and do horrible things. People who have no mercy whatsoever. This is the nafs, the human being. You, each one of us here can become like that, you know. We have the potential to become that. But alhamdulillah, we are Muslims. We have submitted to the way Allah, our Creator, wants us to be because He knows what this nafs He created. He knows what it's capable of doing. So we are Muslims, alhamdulillah. Wallahi, for those of many Muslims these days do not understand the blessing of being a Muslim. Or you can control your nafs and you can direct it and have control over it. But my dear brothers and sisters, controlling your nafs is not an easy thing. You know, when you want to tame a horse, a wild horse, what does the horseman do? The horseman, if he wants to get rid of this wild horse because it's giving too much trouble, all he needs to do is put a bullet to its head and it's gone. One bullet, finished, very easy. But if he wants to use the horse and he wants to ride on it and he wants to make his living out of the horse and so on then that horseman has to go through so much agony maybe even pain lots of pain and he will also subject himself to some sort of danger but in the end he would have tamed the horse and the horse will understand what its duty has to be with its reins you can move it to the right or to the left by a single touch of your finger for those of you who know how to ride horses with a tiny kick you don't have to do it tiny kick on the stomach the horse understands that it has to gallop or it has to trot or it has to walk or should it just stop so by using the reins and tiny kick you've tamed the horse but it takes a long effort brothers and sisters and this is how Allah has created our life to be that you earn the level you reach you have to earn it you have to work towards it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran 
وأن ليس للإنسان إلا ما سعى وأن سعيه سوف يرى ثم يجزاه الجزاء الأوفى which means and man will only reach that which he or she strives for and works towards and Allah will watch your actions and he will reward you according to your deeds you don't become a doctor without working towards it and training yourself you don't become a manager without getting some training as well my brothers and sisters those of you who are parents if you complain about raising your children and training your children being the most hardest thing then think again I think there is one thing that you have missed which is the most difficult to train and tame and that is yourself the nafs that we have and I always use this the children often don't obey their parents but they will always imitate you isn't that correct? they will always imitate you so if you train your nafs then your child will imitate that nafs which has been trained and what a beautiful upbringing that would be you my dear brothers and sisters Prophet ﷺ said about all of us كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ You are all shepherds all of us are shepherds we all have a flock and you are all responsible for your own flock so if you are single you're not a parent you're not responsible for anybody you're not a king you're not a leader you're not in charge of anything whatsoever then think again you are still in charge of one thing which you are using at the moment but doesn't belong to you and that is your nafs your soul and your body you have to tame it you have to control it you have to look after it and you've got to know the ways and the only way to know the ways is by seeking the advice of the one who made this body and this soul and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so alhamdulillah again for being blessed as being Muslims we are conscious people aware people as for the shahawat, who knows what shahawat means? Anybody? Desires. Yes, desires. <laughs> That's the topic. Who knows another name for desires? We just said them before. So we've got desires. What else? Huh? Temptations. Temptations. Naam. They are part of the desires. What else? Whims and egos. All of these are part of our desires. You can sometimes have good temptations. A man can tempt for his wife. In halal of course. And vice versa. You can... Uh, you know, you can get so... I mean, you can also desire food. You can desire water. You can desire a bit of a nice dwelling, for example. There's nothing wrong with that in Islam. But be careful, brothers and sisters. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made food and drink and intercourse in halal way and all of these other desires halal you got to be careful if you let them run wild you don't tame them, you don't control them that halal food and that halal drink and that halal intercourse will become evil and haram and we will explain this insha'Allah very soon so the shahawat are the things that you yourself as a human being the things that I desire selfishly for myself that would satisfy any one of my ego, my whims my uh, temptations all of these types of desires so when I eat I'm satisfying my stomach and myself when I drink I'm satisfying myself if I earn a bit of money I'm satisfying myself if I you know, a person has intercourse in halal, satisfying themselves. So, shahawat are the things that satisfy you, your body. But there is also something else that you need to satisfy other than that, and that is your soul. We must also satisfy and elevate our soul. Basically, the soul and the body together. We don't want to become selfish people, greedy people, grubble for, for the disease of want, want for myself. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, By the one who possesses my soul in his hand, 
None of you will enter paradise until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. The Muslim acts in the opposite way, as a training. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says with regards to the shahawat, my brothers and sisters listen carefully. After the prophets came, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَخَلَفَ مِن بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَاتَّبَعُوا الشَّهَوَاتِ فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّا And so there came after them, after these noble prophets, there came after them خلف, a creation, a generation who lost their worship. Salah means worship. Who lost their worship, their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and instead began to follow their lusts, their temptations and their desires. And when you lose the worship of Allah, brothers and sisters, then the only thing a person is going to look for are his desires. Allah says in the Quran, Have you heard of one who takes his own desire as his own God? They are the ones who don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next thing you're going to take is your own desire, brothers and sisters. And look at the people who don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who don't have a way of life that is disciplined by the, by the revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at them. They grovel over the things which whatever their nafs, their desire wants. And so you find that in many degenerated societies, you find that they may grovel over um, you know, food as being their main source of living. They say, we eat to live. Others they say, we live to eat. And then there are people who instead of children, they take dogs or cats as being their next children or their pets. They take on, so they want to you know, fulfill their own desire. So they want to think about themselves. And they become selfish and greedy. A Muslim does not become that. And a Muslim strives towards doing the things that will make sure that you will not reach that. And one of the best ways is fasting. Yes, brothers and sisters, one of the best ways of controlling ourselves and teaching ourselves a lesson is fasting. Listen carefully. In the beginning, in the first 12 or 13, probably even 14 years of the message of the Prophet of Muhammad وسلم, after he came with the message, after 14, 13 or 14 years, there was no compulsory fasting at all. No Muslim was compelled to fast. There was no month of Ramadan to fast as we have now. Yes, there was salat, prayer. There was the abstaining from alcohol. Hijab came down 10 years later, even before fasting. So fasting was made obligatory two years after the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Mecca to Medina. Two years after he was in Medina. Before that, the ayah in the Quran tells us that people fasted voluntarily. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requested from them if they wanted that they can fast voluntarily. And I presume there were three, three days of each month. If you didn't want to fast, then you can feed a poor person in, its, in exchange. It was a voluntary thing. Does anybody know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make it compulsory upon them while they were in Mecca? Until they establish themselves in Medina. Does anybody, can anyone have a guess or if they know, please call it out. Does anyone know this? The answer, I know that some of you do know but you're shy to answer. Probably afraid to show off maybe. But let's inshallah encourage the others. Does anybody know why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the reasons why he postponed the, making fasting compulsory till 13, 14 years later. I'll give you a hint. Yes? Ahmed, not to push them away from the deen. Probably this was a subtle reason, but there is even a stronger reason than that. Abdullah. I think the level of Iman was strong enough, ya Akhi. There was something else. It's got something to do with hardship. Well, let's analyze the situation. I need you to listen to this carefully so you can understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes fasting compulsory. Non-Muslims who are here will understand this. In Mecca, 
the migrants, the Muslims who were with the Prophet ﷺ were already poor enough. They could hardly survive their day-to-day -day meals. They had hardly had a meal a day. They were persecuted. And they were driven out of their homes. They were already in hardship as it is. They had, were struggling through poverty, through hunger and thirst. They were struggling through bodily harm. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to compel them to fast would be a torture. It would be a torture. Do you not see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ Whoever of you is sick, ill, or is on a journey, on a travel, they don't have to fast, they can make it up on other days. Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ وَلِتُكَبِّرُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ Which means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Allah wants ease for you. He doesn't want hardship for you. That's not the intention of fasting. And so that at the end of it, you can praise Allah and glorify Him by celebrating Eid. And so that you may be thankful. Wow, so much lessons to be learned from this verse. Wallah al -Azim. They didn't need taming when they were already in hardship and poverty. They were feeling the hunger already. They were feeling the poverty already. They were already disciplined and tamed. They were already patient, alhamdulillah. They had all the reasons that a person needs to fast already there, established. But when they reached Medina, and they were established, they, be elevated, they began to have more luxury than before. They had dwellings. They had food. They had water. They were safe. And when you're safe and you have luxury, brothers and sisters, what happens to the nafs, to the person when they have luxury? They begin to forget Allah's pleasure and they begin to become impatient. They, become less they have less gratitude. They forget the feeling of poverty. They forget the poor people who are starving involuntarily. Yes, you begin to have pride. You begin to become spoiled. So, you need to control it and tame it by by letting it go through some sort of hardship like taming a horse. So you make it fast. And here insha'Allah comes the enumeration of all the benefits of fasting. They show themselves shining like a beautiful crown. Like the sun shining in the dawn. And bringing out the rays of light. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always wants the best for us out of His commandments brothers and sisters. Any Muslim who believes that any commandment or prohibition in Islam is a hardship for you? Then my dear brother or sister, you have wronged in your understanding of Allah and His Messenger. Allah says in the Quran, وَاللَّهُ يُرِيدُ أَن يَتُوبَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَيُرِيدُ الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الشَّهَوَاتِ أَن تَمِيلُوا مَيْلًا عَظِيمًا يريد الله أن يخفف عنكم وخلق الإنسان ضعيفا. Which means Allah wants to lessen the burden off your shoulders. All these burdens of the worldly desires and the worldly influences that can harm yourself and degrade yourself. Allah wants to lift that away from you. He doesn't want it to, to come to you. He doesn't want it to degrade you. Allah wants to lift you away from that. But those who do follow their desires, those who do follow their whims, those who do like following their egos and satisfying their body, their body in every way and means, what do they want? They want you to turn away, away from this discipline, from this consciousness, from this aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from this closeness to Allah, from this control of yourself. They don't want you to control. They want you to drink alcohol to lose yourself. They want you to live life as they call it to, the, to its fullest. Wallahi, it is to its absolute degradation. They want you to live it. That's the truth. Allah wants to make the things easy for you and, and forgive you. But man was created weak. By fasting, you make yourself strong, brothers and sisters. Ayyuh al-Ikhwah, brothers and sisters in Islam. 
When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you as it was prescribed upon the people who were before you. Meaning, before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the people of Jesus and Moses and Abraham and all of them had to fast at a given stage, at a certain way. And some of the narrations say that they used to fast three days of every month. Yes. So Allah prescribed it upon us the same way He prescribed it upon the people before us. Christians fast, Jews fast, those of ancient religions also fast. And so do Muslims, so it's not a new thing. كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ So that what? Allah says, In the hope, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ In the hope that you may reach consciousness, God consciousness, awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. The link between fasting and consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so strong that it's unbelievable. What is taqwa? Does anybody know what taqwa is? I'd like to engage the audience in these things. Does anyone know what taqwa means? Sister at the back, my ex-student. Sorry? I didn't hear that. Oneness in Allah? Not exactly. She forgot what I taught her back at the... <laughs> okay, someone else? Damn it. Self-consciousness? Very, very close. Fear of Allah. Fear of Allah. It results in fear of Allah. Basically, similar to what Damir said, God consciousness. I just said it before. Meaning being aware of Allah's presence at all times. And also it means, as fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, placing a barrier between you and harm. Placing a barrier between you and harm. Thirdly, always monitoring and being aware of every step that you take because Allah will be writing it. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sorry, will be recording it through His angels. And so, and so the, uh, the uh, ancient predecessor said, Taqwa is like a person passing through a land full of thorny branches. Every step that you take, you have to watch out because you may be pricked with a thorny branch. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us through our fasting to reach the state and the level of consciousness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim is always aware. A Muslim is conscious. And the greatest level is the Prophets. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to go to sleep, they used to ask him, Ya Rasulullah, when you go to sleep, don't you forget? He said, our eyes sleep, but the Prophet's hearts do not sleep. Complete. He, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 100% consciousness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we strive towards that means. We are aware. We're conscious about everything. Taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest virtue anyone can have. And this is where paradise is available. Fasting therefore is one of the unique ways of finding a relationship between you and Allah, between you and yourself, between you and your egos. You as a true believer, my dear brother or sister, give up and surrender your most basic needs in life. Remember this word, basic needs. This is the basic need of every human being, to eat and drink. And of course as well, the desire, excuse me for saying it, I need to say it a few times today, in, in Sydney a brother reminded me and said, he kept on saying it all the time, what's happening? The word sexual desire. So a human being in his nature, in her nature, requires food and drink and sexual desire. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has created us with. But Allah asks us, and commands us to stop and abandon that from sunrise to sunset. Ya Allah. Ayyaman ma'dudat. For a few days, for about a month. Some psychologists and even great scholars say that if you uh, practice something for about 30 days, you'll, be, you'll develop it into a habit. And that habit has the potential to last for a further six months with ease. You'll do it with ease. So if you get yourself accustomed to something for at least 30 days, then you will find yourself for the next six months doing it in ease, automatically and in comfort. This is why the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ, when Ramadan used to come, they would fast. And then after Ramadan finished, they would remain six months asking Allah to accept what they had fasted. The six months later after that, they will be asking Allah to make them live to the next moment of Ramadan and they will be preparing themselves by fasting voluntary days. So it's never ended. Our month of fasting, my dear brothers and sisters, is our whole life. It's not just the month of Ramadan. That's what it's about. 
Ya Allah. And brother Abu Hamza, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him yesterday, was talking about this. The month of Ramadan, fasting, having taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only for 30 days or 29 days. The meaning of Ramadan, as Abu Hamza said yesterday, it's like a course. You are controlling and taming yourself. You are practicing in knowing how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the rest of the days. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the month of Ramadan to send down the Qur'an in it. That's how valuable it is. Allah says in the Qur'an, إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْرُ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرُ لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ خَيْرٌ مِّنْ أَلْفِ شَهْرُ تَنَزَّلُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ فِيهَا بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ أَمْرُ سَلَامٌ هِيَ حَتَّى مَطْلَعِ الْفَجْرُ We have sent this Qur'an down in the night of power in Ramadan. And what would you know of the night of power? What would explain to you what it is? It is better than a thousand months. In that night, the angels descend from the heavens in a night which is full of peace and tranquility until the dawn. Allah chose this wonderful night in the glorious month of Ramadan. He actually sent down the whole Qur'an. Yes, we all know that Jibreel alayhi salam sent it down to the Prophet alayhi salam stage by stage, but it was actually brought down to the worldly sky, to the first sky as we believe, into a place called Baytul Izza, the house of honor. And the angels knew it, and Jibreel alayhi salam knew the Qur'an, and he began to give it to Muhammad alayhi salam stage by stage. But it was in that night the Qur'an was sent down as a whole. A glorious night. What is so important about this glorious month that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose it for our fasting? A lot of people think it's hardship. Oh Allah, it's a blessing. Here are the benefits to you. Number one. Fasting, firstly, is the source of forgiveness for one's sins. How? The Prophet wasallam said, Whoever fasts Ramadan with faith and hope, Iman and Wahtisaban, for its reward, shall have all of his previous sins forgiven for him. Narrated by Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. He also said, the scholars explain, when you hope and have faith in the fasting, it means that you are hoping for its reward while being pleased to perform it without considering it something heavy or a hardship upon you. So you are a person who doesn't whine and complain until it's time to break your fast. If you are such a person, then you're really not going to reap out the rewards of fasting at all. For the Prophet wasallam said, رُبَّ صَائِمٍ It could be that a fasting person will receive nothing from their fasting except hunger and thirst. وَرُبَّ قَائِمٍ And it could be that a person would be standing in the night prayer, staying away from his sleep, standing in their night prayer in Ramadan, and will receive nothing but sleepless nights. So therefore, it is not about abstaining from food and drink, as many people think. It is actually abstaining from the haram with greater emphasis in this month. Why? In order to adapt yourself, and to tame yourself, and to train yourself for what comes after Ramadan, and before Ramadan, and for the rest of your life. That is where the forgiveness lies. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, a person who is fasting, if another person wants to start them in a fight, or swears at you, or abuses you, do not respond to them except, Allahumma inni sa'im, Oh Allah, I am fasting. What has responding to them got to do with abstaining from food and drink? Because fasting is not really about abstaining from the food and drink, even though there are great benefits from it. If you abstain from your food and drink, and you are abusive, and you slander, and you backbite, and gossip, and you swear, and you still don't pray, and you spend the nights playing cards, watching movies, not abstaining from listening to the music, and so on and so forth, 
What is fasting to you? What is fasting to you, brother or sister? This is why the Prophet ﷺ, when he was climbing the limbar, he said, Ameen, 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 three times. The first time, Jibreel ﷺ said to him, May his nose be rubbed in dust whoever reaches their parents in old age and they die and still because of them they did not enter paradise. He said, Ameen. Secondly, May his nose be rubbed in dust whoever hears your name and doesn't say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Ameen. Third time, May his nose be rubbed in dust whoever approaches Ramadan finishes Ramadan and Allah still has not forgiven for them. Yani they fasted. They stayed away from their food and drink. Did everything necessary with regards to abstaining from food and drink and intercourse. But still, they were not forgiven. Fasting has many rights. There are many purposes. If you don't fulfill those purposes, then you are not fasting really. Fasting also should make you feel as if you are doing something beloved and special to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I use this example in Sydney and I will use it again. Husband and wife. When a husband and wife want to love one another and come closer to one another, if you really want to, then the husband for example does spe- things that are special to his wife and the wife does things that are special to her husband even though it may cause some hardship to either spouse. Meaning, it may cause hardship to me to do this for my wife, but it's something special to her. By doing the things that are special to the, your loved ones, you become even closer to them. So when you are fasting, because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this month, He sent down His Qur'an in this month. He sent down, in fact, all His revelations in Ramadan. Did you know that? The Zabur, the Torah, the Injil, all of them sent down in Ramadan. It must be something special to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah says, Hadith of Qudsi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Everything the son of Adam does is for him, except for the, meaning the angels, they reward them. I have made a, you know, criteria for the angels to reward them, except for fasting, for it is for me to reward in a special way. My servant leaves and abandons his food and drink for me. For me. He leaves it for me. This is why you're doing it. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ana ajzi bihi. I am the one who rewards for it. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ The one whom Muhammad ﷺ's soul is in his hands. لَخَلُوفُ فَمُ الصَّائِمْ خَيْرٌ مِنْ الْمِسْكِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ مِنَ الْمِسْكِ أو كَمَا قَالْ He said, the changing of the breath that emanates from your, from your mouth or from your stomach, that change of breath, is more pleasant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than musk. This is something special to Allah. So when you are fasting, brothers and sisters, and you are hungry or thirsty, remember, you're doing something special for Allah, who will surely take care of you. It strengthens your qualities of patience, my dear brothers and sisters. In fact, it takes care of all the three types of patience. There are three types of patience, not just one. The first type of patience is when a person perseveres upon something by continually performing an act of worship, such as... uh, you know, fasting and breaking it at an appointed time, continuously. You are actually persevering by being patient in doing so. You are also patient by persevering, by refraining from what Allah forbade. So you are refraining from food, drink, sexual intercourse, all those other things in Ramadan. So you are being patient by abstaining from the haram. And also by remaining under control in all times of hardship and difficulties. There are pains in hunger. There is thirst in hunger. It's difficulties. You are patient. You don't swear. You don't lose it. And if you lose it and start swearing and all of that, what, what, what are you getting out of it? Nothing. And this is why it trains, should train the husbands when they come back from work very hungry and their wives have worked all day and they're cooking their meal or probably they've forgotten to cook their meal or they were too tired to cook the meal. The husband walks in and thinks only about himself. This is the husband who's not used to fasting out or hasn't sowed or, or brought out the benefits of fasting during Ramadan. He is the first to sm- scream at her and yell at her and shout at her and say, Where's the food woman? Where's the food woman? And they barge out of the house and lose it at the children and everything because of hunger. And this is where they got the famous saying, the best way to a man's heart is his stomach. I don't like that saying. <laughs> right? You are spoiling him and you are not helping him. But also, don't starve him. Yeah? It's also no good for you. But uh, what we are trying to say is that remind him of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
after he eats. It reminds you, my dear brother or sister, about the true goal and purpose in life. How? You see, when you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before your most basic, basic needs, before your natural needs, food and drink, and you put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before that, you have satisfied the condition of the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ I have not created the jinn and, man and human beings for any other purpose except to worship me. I do not want from them to feed me or to give me provision. So you re-establish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your main goal and your main purpose. This is what you're meant to think about during Ramadan, when you are hungry and when you're fasting. And this is why it's not recommended to be around food or smelling food when you are fasting. You will walk away from the benefits of the fasting. And you really begin to discover your true self, the reality of yourself. And what you really want out of life and what is truly important to you. What's the most important thing to you, brothers and sisters, when you are fasting? Is it pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or pleasing your stomach, really? You begin to discover yourself and find where you lack so that you can climb and rise and become a better person. It gives you time to think and ponder. You see, if you were to monitor our, all the things that we do in our day, if you were to take away food and drink and take away, I say it again, the hormonal desire, right, the, the uh, lustful desires, if you take them away, you'll get bored. Yes, you will get bored. And those of us who are fasted know this. Because you don't have much to do. First of all, you don't have much energy. There's not much to entertain yourself with. And if you were to monitor the problems of the world, I tell you right now, and there's a hadith relating to it, it's mostly the result of food and sexual intercourse. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said, and see the brother is laughing because he's the one that reminded me, brother, you keep saying sexual intercourse. <laughs> I have to brother, subhanAllah, I don't know, hormonal desires, how's that? The Prophet ﷺ said, If you can guarantee me what is between your lips, your jaws, and guarantee to God what is between your legs, meaning keeping it away from haram, keeping away from going towards those means, then I will guarantee you paradise. It's as though he is saying, the result of all evil in the world is the result of of this mouth, the food, and the result of those hormonal desires. Really. So a Muslim who is fasting begins to think and ponder and has time to go over their sins, repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, read some Qur'an. And really you find yourself when you're fasting, you find lots of time available, don't you? You really do have lots of time. You rest and you think and you ponder. And that's what we lack in our life. And the most imp- one of the most important things is that you feel the plight of others. Yes, in theory we always talk about, you know, starvation, children starving, dying from starvation, people who are going through poverty. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I want to give you a scenario. Imagine right now that you look into your savings account and after you've worked for 10 or 20 years and you saved up those tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars and you found that your bank account was almost down to zero. And you think to yourself, where did it all go? And you realize that you've spent it on your living expenses. What kind of a person will you become right there and then? Will you be a person who will start to blame your wife? And have quarrels and fights with her saying it's your fault? And so she will say it's your fault? And you start quarreling about it. Will you then lose your temper at your children when that poor child, the son and daughter, come and say, Daddy, Mummy, and you lose it at them. Or probably even smack them. Probably even harm them because you have no patience of that loss. Will you be a person who is embarrassed to meet your peers and to, for them to find out what you really have in your savings account? What kind of a person will you become? What kind of a personality will you develop at that stage, my dear brothers and sisters? If you have taqwa and iman, you will be satisfied still because you know that the future is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu said, always look at those who are beneath you. Meaning what? 
those who are less advantaged, who are disadvantaged than you in worldly things. And do not look at those who are more advantaged than you. Because if you do so, if you look at the people who are more advantaged than you in worldly gain, those who have more money than you or status or whatever that is, or beauty or whatever that is, and you do not look at those who are beneath you, less advantaged than you, then my dear brother or sister, Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, you will reach a point of evil personality, a spoilt attitude, where you will become ungrateful for the favors of Allah which He has already bestowed upon you. Will you at that stage when you find that you have less money, turn around and say, Alhamdulillah, I still have my health. Alhamdulillah, I can still work and learn from my mistakes. Alhamdulillah, the most important thing is that my children know a juzat from the Qur'an. Alhamdulillah, my wife still has a hijab. Alhamdulillah, I'm still a mu'min and I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, because this type of iman, what does it do to you? It makes a person become optimistic. It makes you think that there is still hope. And so you become a happy person. But never look at those who are disadvantaged from you. And I have a little presentation to show you so that probably I can get you to feel what I'm talking to you about. So that we can appreciate. When you fast, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, and you give up that basic need, you realize that really, you realize that, subhanallah, food and drink, the basic needs, you have given them up and you've managed to survive. You've managed to continue your life with happiness. You've managed to really still raise a family. You've managed to do your normal duties. You know why? Because you had prepared yourself for that fasting. You were ready before Ramadan, before fasting came. And we ask Allah to save us from the disease that goes around today in society, the disease of want. You know, in advertisement and televisions, they keep showing us these superficial things that somehow psychologically and mentally makes us think that we need this. We need it to survive. We need it for our life. It's like you have to have it, otherwise you're depressed. Ah, anxiety. The wife starts falling to the ground. She doesn't have a treadmill. What are we doing? We need these needs. Oh my goodness. So when fasting comes, and you realize that food and drink, I mean, is treadmill more important than food and drink, for example? Is, uh, for example, going to the hairdresser every, uh, every two days more important than food and drink? Is a man's, yeah, I mean, the man having um, you know, his nice car or a nice, um, I don't know, you can give me some examples, you name it. Better, I mean, more important to them than food and drink? You will give up everything for your food and drink, wouldn't you? So in Ramadan, Allah puts you to the test. I've given up my, my food and drink, subhanAllah. And I still survived. I managed for 30, 29, 30 days to, to go and I feel much better. Alhamdulillah. So Allah takes you to the most extremes, you know. What's the worst thing that can happen? وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ And give glad tidings to those who are truly patient. I have a little presentation, brother. Can you... Something that inshaAllah, a little nasheed... And I have to give gratitude to my sister who helped me prepare these PowerPoints. If there are any spelling mistakes, it's my fault, not my sister's. But, actually it is my sister's fault, she should have looked at it. <laughs> but, uh, I would like you to listen to it carefully, inshallah, and tell me what you get out of it.
My conclusion, brothers and sisters, I hope that I hope that this has given you an idea of what to expect in Ramadan. There's so much to talk about still. But my intention today was to try and reach the hearts a little bit. So that we can ourselves discover for ourselves and by ourselves the benefits in Ramadan. And it would be nice if you concentrate day by day to probably write for yourself as your own diary. What did you benefit today out of fasting? What did you discover about yourself and your connection between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you did not know before? What were you lacking in? And share it with your children. Maybe not what you were lacking in, but share with your children also this activity and with your family. Pray in the night. Read lots of Qur'an. And anticipate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your fasting from you. So that it will not only be one month, but it will, your month will transform into your whole life. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. And I end it by saying, Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Hadha walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhum.